exist, you deserve to exist. And if you deserve to exist, you deserve to be who you are as fully as you possibly can. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Peace is every step. We are actually in a period of global spiritual emergency. And I want to really stress that that's a, a positive thing. You are here for a reason, to be yourself expressed in fullness and in love. I am you. You are me. There's only one of us here. Why would I want to hurt myself? Well, I think love is the fabric of everything. Hi, and Hi. I'm another version of you. And with that, we begin another episode of The Waking Universe, and I'm your host, Lance Mungia. And today we're talking about story. What really interests me as, as, as the host of the show, as a filmmaker myself, is the stories that we tell to ourselves in our lives. And it seems like all great stories are about authentic storytelling. And today I am actually sitting here with an authentic storyteller. Uh, I am here with Miss Catherine Ann Jones, and Hello. she is a prolific, award-winning author, screenwriter, playwright, and global teacher. And uh, Catherine, thank you so much. I'm oh, truly, truly to honored yeah. to have you out at the studio today. And okay. um, today we're talking about your work. Um, your first book was Way of the Story, and yeah. and uh, that's the way of the story there. And and you have a new book coming out called um, Heal Yourself with Writing, and. Um, I am really, really curious as to your journey, as to how, you know, what is your story? I mean, like, how did you even get involved in, in, well, in all of this uh, storytelling? Well, you know, Einstein was wrong. The world is made up of stories, not atoms. Mm -hmm. And I guess mine's no exception. Um, my first career was acting in New York, in the theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for a number of years, played, I guess, in 55 plays. And I didn't, the, the new plays I was auditioning for, I didn't like the way women were portrayed. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and wrote my first long play about Virginia Woolf, the British writer. And uh, it was produced and uh, won the National Endowment of the Arts Award that year. So that launched me on my second career was writing plays and I wrote nine others that were produced. One was optioned by MGM, The Women of Cedar Creek, and that I was wooed by Hollywood. And then I started writing feature films and um, TV series, ending with Touch by an Angel. A kind of small niche I had in Hollywood is um, I only write consciousness-raising films or socially responsible mm -hmm. stories. So translated, that means no gratuitous sex or violence. So obviously that was a very small niche in Hollywood, <laughs> you can imagine. Well, it, it's one of the things that, that uh, I really wanted to talk to you about and that I really responded mm -hmm. to in, in yeah. your writing work is, is this idea of uh, conscious filmmaking, of, of, of being a conscious storyteller and being aware of yeah. the types of stories that you're telling um, and, and really going within to find those stories and not, not uh, just relying upon formulas or well, that's uh, those it. types of things. I, I tried to write the stories that I wanted to see up there mm -hmm. on the screen. Also, I'm a mother and I'm sure that was an uh, influence. You know, what did I want my son to see? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stories are powerful. It, they can be powerful in a positive or a negative way. Um, for instance, uh, Oliver Stone did a movie years ago, The Natural Born Killers. Mm -hmm. And the week had opened in the Midwest, um, a teenage couple went out and randomly killed three people, strangers, mm -hmm. as an aphrodisiac. And when the police apprehended them and asked for their names, they gave the names of the characters in the movie. They had just seen Natural Born Killers. Mm -hmm. So that's one example of how the power of media in our lives today. So do you say, do you think that, that media has a responsibility uh, yes, to the public? definitely, I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Not everyone agrees. They'll say we're just mirroring what's out there already, mm -hmm. but they can make it worse. But too. it seems to me that if you're if they're just mirroring what's out there already, that every year it seems to get more and more uh, 
uh, over the top, I guess you could say. It's like, a, you know, like this This has been the summer of, of the blockbuster explosion yeah. into the world movies. You know, right. it's like, it's like how many more explosions can we take? I mean, you know, there, there's a, I, I've seen, you know, Manhattan destroyed, I think, five times just this year. There are all, yeah. also, I can't remember the name of it now, there was a movie that predated 911 that was about that. Mm -hmm. In other words, it happened in a film and then it happened. Well, know. I think that also begs another interesting question, which is yeah. are authors tapping into sort of a collective unconscious in the Jungian sense uh, to come up with that material? Because there, there, there have been a lot of uh, written works that have been very prescient. Uh, take like the work of Jules Verne. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. the trip to the moon and, you know, uh, yeah, nuclear true. power and submarines yeah, and all these things. Sci-fi, you see that a lot. Mm -hmm. But that's a little different. Jules Verne really didn't write about anything that could make someone go out and shoot someone. You know? Right. So mm -hmm. slightly different, I think. Mm -hmm. Of course, you may be aware, because you work in Hollywood too, that money for features is mainly made on the back end. Mm -hmm. That means the movies they sell overseas in Asia and the Middle East. And the most popular films are the very the most violent action movies. Mm -hmm. They can that that's where the money is made. So that's one reason why we have so many of that genre mm -hmm. out there. But it seems to me like uh, whether it's a, a violent movie or, or any kind of movie, um, that, that good storytelling is universal. Um, and, and that uh, you know, it's, it's not about uh, just the action or, or these types of things. There's plenty of really violent action films that, that fail miserably. Uh, why? Why is it that, that uh, you know, if that was well, the case, then... Well, first of all, I'm not against having violence in movies. We mm -hmm. have violence in fairy tales. Mm -hmm. If you've ever read Grimm's, they're really grim. My objection is the gratuitous way they're exploited, mm -hmm. especially for young minds. But um, there is violence in the world, so that's part of the world's story, of course. Mm -hmm. I often wonder when are we going to sort of wake up to the fact that, that uh, the things that we portray in the world to our, our kids probably do have an effect on those kids. And I'm guilty of this myself. I mean, I've done action films and, and, and these kinds of things. And I think that, that those things, these things also have a place. I think that, that like, you know, being able to, uh, you know, experience something viscerally on the screen, is, it can be yes. a great thing. But it depends on how you do it. Right, that, right. It's, it's a, again, I think it's, it's the, the uh, where it becomes irresponsible, I think, is when the story is told without any sort of uh, meaning or, or yeah. uh, anything to it. It becomes just an exercise in, in sort of um, showing the violence as opposed to it being about something. Exactly. Well, I, I guess because I have the background from the theater as an actor and playwright, I gravitate toward character-driven stories. Mm -hmm. To me, as stories about what the main character does. Mm -hmm. It's not about um, special effects or, mm -hmm. you know, I like my, the ki my kind of film that I like to see and write is what happens between two or more people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean shooting each other necessarily. Well, but even even in a, uh, I think any anything is about that interaction between two people. It's like what is it that makes them tick, and 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 as a result, you get to see it as a mirror of yourself. And, and yeah, but I'm speaking more or less of dramatic action. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you'll observe, it's very true of many action films, like they'll have a car chase and something blow up and this and that. That's not dramatic action. Mm -hmm. That's action. Right. But it actually interrupts the dramatic action. That mm -hmm. is what's going on between two human beings, mm -hmm. psychologically. Mm -hmm. You know, so in a way it works against, to my mind. Mm -hmm. One of the things I teach, I taught at, in New York at the New School and then USC mm -hmm. uh, screenwriting. One of the things I try to teach the students is what happens in a story the most important thing in a story is not what happens. The most important thing in a story is not what happens. The most important part of a story is how what happens affects your main character and changes him in some vital way, changes his, the way he views himself, other people, and the world around him. Mm -hmm. That's why as I vote for the Oscars and Emmys and I judge film festivals sometimes, and I can sit there totally unmoved when I see car chases and this happen and then this happen. And then I'll read a, um, I'll read a short story by uh, Fitzgerald, 
F. Scott Fitzgerald called Bernice Bob's Her Hair. Mm -hmm. And it's just about a young girl in the 30s who cuts off her hair. You know, from an action point of view, you'd say nothing happens, mm -hmm. and yet I'd be in tears. Mm -hmm. So it's not what happens, it's the effect of what yes, happens yes. on the character. And in most action movies, they'll go from one action to another without really showing the main character processing that. Right, I've, oft, I've heard yeah. it said that uh, um, actually structure is character. You know, that, that, that really the character determines uh, everything else that happens in the film. If it's not about the character, you know, if it's not uh, related to the growth of the character, then why is it in the screenplay? Well, I would say plot is character. Mm -hmm. Aristotle said it before yes. me. Mm -hmm. Plot is character. Mm -hmm. Is that different than structure? It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Structure, there's a lot of mystique about story structure in mm -hmm. Hollywood. I have a whole chapter of it in mm -hmm. the whole way of story. But structure is simply the sequence of your scenes. Mm -hmm. That's why in structure is probably more important in screenplay than any other form of narrative writing. Mm -hmm. It's always important in novels and too, but especially screenplays. So just by sometimes rearranging the order of your scenes, that's what I do as a writing consultant. Mm -hmm. I may change things around. It can be a totally different script mm -hmm. or book, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and, and uh, they, they've often said too that uh, um, you know, it's not the writing, it's the rewriting. And it's really not even the rewriting, it's the editing. You know, because uh, you know, like a famous example of, of changing the structure around would be Pulp Fiction, where, you know, he started in that, uh, Quentin Tarantino started that film out as three distinct short stories and yeah. then just started playing with the structure right. and changing things, the order of things around right. and, and right. Uh, created something that was much more interesting. Yeah. You know, so. Well, writing is rewriting. Any mm -hmm. form of writing is, mm -hmm. is, of course, that's where it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that influenced me as uh, I was an undergraduate at University of Texas in Austin. And I loved reading and I kept delaying writing plays. I was in the drama department then because I thought, well, it won't be Chekhov or Shakespeare, so why bother? <laughs> why should I bother? You know, uh -huh. I'm never going to come up to that mark. And then I got permission. People may not know, but University of Texas has one of the largest manu original manuscript collections in the world. So even as an undergraduate, I got a pass to go in and hold in my hand and read George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, the poems of Dylan Thomas, mm -hmm. the plays of Tennessee Williams, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at Fern Hill, one of Thomas's great poems, and on one line, just one word, he had crossed out that word nine times and added nine more words and crossed them out. Mm -hmm. And I had this epiphany. I thought Fern Hill didn't come out fully baked. Mm -hmm. It went through a process. That's right. And that yeah. was a turning point for me because yeah. I thought, you know, you have a first draft and then you've got something to work with. Mm -hmm. But when we pick up and read a, a great play or novel, we think it comes out like that, mm -hmm. you know, like from the head of Zeus or something, mm -hmm. but uh, it doesn't. That's true. I mean, I think so. it's, uh, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, equal parts talent and persistence and, and the objectivity yeah. to, to keep at it and, and know what is right to leave in and what is needed to be taken out. I had the good fortune during my acting days to I was in a Broadway production of Death of a Salesman. And uh, we were out of town in Philadelphia with the pre-Broadway. And we were having problems. George C. Scott was directing. and He was abusing himself a lot you mm -hmm. know, with drugs and drink and uh, angriest man I ever met in my life. So he was, and Marty Balsam then was our Willie Loman, and he, he was making it hard for all of us. Anyway, George was fired. Mm -hmm. And guess who they flew in the last 10 days of rehearsal? Arthur Miller. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So we had the privilege of having Miller direct us those final 10 days, so I got to know him a little bit. And I asked him once over a, a meal, I said, because I was thinking of writing my first long play then, the Virginia Woolf play, and I said, how many drafts of Death of a Salesman did you do? Mm -hmm. He thought for a moment, and he said, 35. Wow. 35. So 
that's a process. Yes, yes. So not only as a writer, but later a teaching of writing that, you know, these were little turning points along the way. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think it is, a, um, I think artists, particularly young artists or, or up and coming artists have a tendency to idolize the work that's come before them. And, and I think it's so important to realize Yes. They went through the same exact exactly. troubles that you're going through That's right what now. What you know, yeah. there is no such thing, you know, uh, as the perfect thing. No. You know. Well, not on the first not on draft the first anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some achieve it later, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But I imagine the Greek plays went through the same process mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as anyone. Well, well, how how does writing become? Um, a tool for uh, growth, a tool for uh, like you know you 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 were very involved in in sort of the um, the empathy of writing and the and the intuitiveness of it. Um, like so so how would you say someone can use writing to actually um, heal themselves, as as you say in your in your book? Um, well, I'm going to preface that by telling you something about my own journey. Okay. I was working in Hollywood writing for Touch by an Angel TV mm -hmm. series. I was writing a movie for Disney for Dolly Parton called Unlikely Angel and teaching two graduate courses at USC in the film department. Mm -hmm. And what happens with people who work in Hollywood, I overdid it mm -hmm. and I kind of had a little burnout. And I went through a time like I just knew I had to get away, do something different for a while. And I went to a school called Pacifica Graduate Institute in uh, Santa Barbara, which is a depth psychology, Carl Jung's training. Mm -hmm. And I got an, a graduate degree, which I didn't need. In fact, my very grounded Texas mother said, what are you going to do? I, I did a degree in archetypal mythology and depth psychology. She said, what are you going to do with a degree in mythology? And so I remember my answer to her, though I didn't fully understand what I meant by it at mm -hmm. the time. I said, Mother, it's not what I'm going to do with mythology. It's what mythology is going to do with me. Hmm. And that led to the two books I, I wrote later. So I had taught the way of story. Both of the books started as workshops, initially at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. Later, I did them in Ojai and um, New York at the Omega Institute in London and other places. And even the Way of Story workshop, though it was about writing, mm -hmm. because I was having them write not only from the left brain, but all of themselves, they would come out of the workshop and say this was life-changing because they hadn't gone to that place before to write. And eventually, when I realized that, that led me toward the new workshop, Heal Yourself with Writing, that's for non-writers as well as writers. It's not about learning how to write, but using writing as a healing modality to self-heal grief and trauma and to create a deeper dialogue with the self, you know, the, in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, the response was amazing. I'll give you one quick example. There was a very successful uh, young woman from Silicon Valley who took the course at Esalen, the healing course. And she had been sexually abused at the age of 16. She was now 35. And she did the workshop, and she later wrote me a letter that for the first time since before the incident, I felt I returned to myself. Hmm. When trauma happens, there's a split from the, from the psyche, from your mind and body. You're mm -hmm. just separated. And shamans knew this in the old days because they, their job as shamans was trying to return the man or woman to the soul. They had become separated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens in modern culture today. I think that happens to everyone. I think that, that, that you, you start off, I think, as a... Um, you know, understanding a lot more, and then as you go through your life, you just get split off from, from yeah. what you intuitively understood before because society kind of reasons it out of you. Exactly. So you stop using your intuition. You stop using uh, that, that sort of more feminine empathy, exactly. you know, maybe. And of course, in our educational system, the left brain, logical thinking, is what is taught and encouraged, not intuition or 
the other side mm -hmm. of the brain. So what I try and do in both workshops and both books is integrate those two sides. Um, also, I, I write and heal yourself with writing. It's not about, I, I can't, I'm going to borrow this sure. for a second, mm -hmm. actually read the first line, so I'll get it right. Our lives may be determined less by past events than by the way we, we remember them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's how to remember and how to revision. You know, it's, it's sort of comical, but people think they remember something as though it's frozen in time and it's, right. e and it's exactly the way it was. Well, I remember learning from, you know, you learn a lot by raising children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember with my son when he was a teenager or at college, I'd remember something where we were both present and I would say it. And my son would pipe up and he said, that's not what happened, mother. It was this, this. And I remember thinking, we're both right. Because we, just like in screenwriting, yeah. we ha each character has her point of view. Yeah. It can be the same incident. So that's a very, very yeah. profound statement because uh, what you're really saying there is that we can change the past by changing the memory of the past. Yes. You know, and that really, you know, from this current moment, how you feel about those past memories, how you sort of um, work through those memories is creating who you are now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful Native American story, parable, mm -hmm. uh, which had a lot to do with me writing, Heal Yourself with Writing. It goes like this, there's a grandfather and his young grandson. Some crisis has happened in the village and the grandfather is going through tension with him. And, um, and the grandfather says to the grandson, I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One wolf is angry and vengeful and unforgiving, and the other wolf is, is compassionate and wise and peaceful. And these two wolves are fighting in my heart. So the little grandson looks up at his grandfather and says, Grandfather, which wolf will win the fight in your heart? And the grandfather answers, the one I feed. So how do we feed the stories that can heal us? Mm -hmm. That's a big part of the book. Hopefully. I think that that is uh, such a great, it's a great um, story, story. Isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah, and such a great way into the technique of, yeah. of what you do because, yeah. because it applies to um, every great character, every great story uh, is, is, is really asking that fundamental question of, of which wolf will I feed? You know? I'll give you another example. Before I had when I was starting to write this book, somehow I got an 11-page letter from a prisoner in Texas somewhere. Somehow he had gotten a copy of The Way of Story, my mm -hmm. earlier book. And I have, in both books, I have short exercises. And I have something called soul dialogues, which is sort of visualization and channeling. And this um, prisoner, had done the exercises and said how it changed his life and mm. helped him. How did it change his life? Well, first I'll tell you what he was in prison for. He had a drinking problem, a lot of Native Americans too. His great-great-grandfather had ridden with Geronimo. He was mm -hmm. Apache. And this young man was drunk and driving his car with his three-year-old daughter in the front seat. He had a car crash, the daughter was killed, mm. and he was jailed for manslaughter. So, it, a terrible story. Mm -hmm. And he sent me, and one passage was so beautiful, I wrote and asked his permission to put it in my new book, Heal Yourself with Writing. Mm -hmm. He was very happy that it would be published there. And he, he, in the Soul Dialogue, he wrote about being a soaring eagle up above the valley. And see, it was very poetic and very beautiful. This is someone in prison for manslaughter. So because of that, I, I don't know how to go about it yet, but I would like to see the new book the, about uh, Heal Yourself with Writing in prisons all across America. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get it to the Vietnam and the Afghanistan, you know, the veterans mm -hmm. who have post-traumatic stress. 
Well, I think that journaling and and uh, talking about your own experiences not only leads to fascinating writing, but it's a uh, it is a healing uh, thing to to not visit. always, not always. That's mm -hmm. why I do my exercises. They're not freestyle journaling. They're very mm -hmm. specific, uh, focused journaling exercises. Talking therapy can have the opposite effect. Of mm -hmm. course, it can be helpful in many instances. But from the somatic point of view, from the body's point of view, if you talk about your trauma, mm -hmm. it, can ha your, it can make you relive the trauma emotionally and physically, and it can re-traumatize the body. Mm -hmm. So as a psychologist, I, to me, that's, that's why I thought, but writing is something much more intimate. It's not talking. It's not. It's it, you're writing it from a deeper place. Mm -hmm. It's it's between you and yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you uh, you and I were talking before about uh, um, a man who had had witnessed some things at Auschwitz and who you had oh, worked yes. with through improvisation. That's know, a wonderful. Shall I tell? Yes, that? please tell me that story. That was a, that was at Esalen some years ago. I was doing the way of story, mm -hmm. the craft and soul of writing. There was a man in his late 70s, I think he was, and as a young man in the army in World War II, he was, one of, he was the first group of soldiers who liberated Auschwitz, the concentration camp, and he never forgot the horrors he saw there, and for decades he had been trying to write a memoir about this. He read portions of what he wrote, but it was very dry and distant. It didn't really move anyone. Mm -hmm. So I said, would you be willing to do an improvisation with me? He was very open. He said, sure. I sat him in a chair. We had about 22 people in the class. And then when his eyes were closed, I had about nine people lie on the floor like they were bodies. And then I did a relaxation, a visualization with him. And I said, when you open your eyes, you're not remembering what happened on that day. You are there. And I want, and you just open your eyes and, and see what you see today as though it's today. And he opened his eyes and he had this epiphany. He had repressed a lot of the things he had actually seen on that day, naturally, because of the traumatic shock. And he remembered seeing a man that he thought was a dead body and realized the man was still alive. And he went and gave water to the man. So I said, do it, get up. And he went and mime, pantomime, giving water. Well, there wasn't a dry eye in the whole class. And he was very moved. He was crying like a baby. And he came up at lunch break to me and he said, this was life changing for me. And then he paused and he said, I know now why I've waited so many decades to write this book, to finish this book. It wasn't enough to remember the past. I had to feel the past. Mm -hmm. It's I a very good example of what happens in these workshops. And I think it is a, um, a very good distinction to make, that, that, that uh, difference between thought and feeling. Because it's yeah. not that you're just thinking about writing or that you're thinking about your past and these things, because you can get lost in those, in those thoughts, but it's changing how you feel about the past and how you feel about your writing and you feel well, about these stories. Well, first, before changing, you have to feel it. Right. We're so educated, both in homes and our school system, to just use the left brain. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel. We may even be writing as a writer or writing down a family or a diary and just writing the facts down. That's not feeling it. That's so how do you change that left-right brain connection to, to be more of a whole writer or a whole person for that matter? Well, that's a process uh, in the way of story. I try and get them to write. Uh, the aim is there are books on craft, which it, craft is important. I taught craft for 20 years in graduate school. But there's what I call the invisibles, which I think are equally important, that intuition, somatic, writing from your physical sensate mm -hmm. self, and channeling, mm -hmm. getting out of the way and letting something come through you. I'm sure there are writers out there who've had the experience that you write something like you weren't there and it just comes through you. Mm -hmm. And later when you read it, 
you say, where did this come from? Yeah, I've had uh, I've had artists on this show. I've, I can yeah. speak from personal experience that that a lot of the time uh, the very best stuff comes when you step exactly. out of the way exactly. and you just let it happen. So I've devised exercises through visualization and things where um, that happens, mm -hmm. and Pete and they read it and they'll say, I had no idea where this comes from, and I have exercises like the personal myth ex exercise where they get in touch with the archetype. Consciously or unconsciously, either we're living an archetype or an archetype is living us. Mm -hmm. An archetype, um, it could be, uh, could be um, Hansel and Gretel. Could you, or, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean, either, a, either an archetype is living us or we are living an archetype? What is that, what's the difference? All right, say there's a woman who's, uh, whose whole identity is being beautiful and being in love. Mm -hmm. Well, she's living uh, a Venus, mm -hmm. you know, the Greek or Roman god Venus, Aphrodite or Venus. And she may not be conscious of it, but that's what's happening. So the more you can, psychologically, the more you can become aware mm -hmm. of which archetype is ruling your, your life, the better. I see, so the, so the archetype is basically giving you um, the model that best fits um, the actions that you're taking so that, so that then you can better understand what you're doing and then by understanding it, you can then change it. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, it's a metaphor, really. Mm -hmm. An archetype's a metaphor, right. but it's usually based on a childhood fairy tale or a story or a comic strip or a TV show that imprinted you, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a saying, I think Joseph Campbell may have said it, if you want to change your life, change your metaphor. Mm. Yes. <laughs> metaphor being something that symbolizes who you are or who you think you are. Because mm -hmm. of course, the first chapter of the new book, Heal Yourself, is about what story are you living. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're living our own stories and we're holding the reins. But sometimes we're living the life of our parents' story. For instance, uh, something the father didn't achieve and is thrust upon, you know, the, um, the child. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it gets more complex. There can be an outer feeling of surpassing the parents, but then there can be stopping your achievement because there's a tacit understanding, succeed, but don't go beyond what your parents did. Uh -huh. So you see how subtle and complex. Yeah, yeah. So this is about not only healing trauma and grief, but finding, seeking out those patterns that are controlling us in some way, and also creating a deeper inquiry or dialogue with the self. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I think I shared with you, Lance, you know how a painter will finish a painting and he'll do that one last stroke and right. know, intuitively he'll know that's where to stop. Yes. yes. When I finished writing the draft, you know, one of the later drafts of the book, and it was time to meet my contract with my publisher and send it in, the day I sent it in, I looked at it on the title page, and you know this word, yourself, is one word. Mm -hmm grammatically speaking. Mm -hmm. Heal yourself, yes. And the last thing I did before I put it in the folder and posted it, I separated those two words. So it's heal yourself with a capital S. Exactly, and like Atma, mm -hmm. like the spiritual self. Right, right. So and then I knew it was done. So that was my because the work is about connecting to your um, authentic. authentic self, which again, as I always say, yeah. is all great storytelling. All, all yes. really stories worth telling are about finding that more authentic self. Yes. And, and so what you're saying is that not just a professional writer can do this, but anyone can do this using these techniques. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I get all kinds of people, and it's uh, it's just magical. I never get tired of teaching. I've been doing it over 30 years now, so, mm -hmm. you know. I never get, because I've had a parallel teaching career even when I was writing plays and mm -hmm. screenplays and so on. But it's never the same, because new individuals, new stories, so, I, it's, I feel very fortunate. Yeah. I've learned by teaching. Yes, so. yes, yes. <laughs> so it's. Uh, I, I think that uh, right now we're living in a time of Sandy Hook, of, of a, a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty. A lot of times, like, l there's, there's a lot of violence uh, out there. And I think there's a need for um, more authentic 
work in the media. How There's do we a, how do we get to that? How do we get back to that that Well, one type big of work? step, I think, and of course this is my Jungian answer since mm -hmm. uh, I'm very influenced by Carl Jung's work is uh, I have a whole chapter on it of facing the shadow. Mm -hmm. I pr I believe with all my heart if each individual would integrate their own shadow, mm -hmm. that part of ourselves we don't like, it's often based on an internal parent. In other words, it's the it's the stuff what that we, we feel guilty about, the stuff that we feel angry about, the stuff that repels us. Uh, the stuff we don't even want to look at. Right. So when you repress your shadow, that mm -hmm. darker part, and we all have it. Mm -hmm. If it's not integrated in process, then it's projected on another individual or a group of individuals, the Native Americans, the Jewish people, mm -hmm. whatever. So that's why it's our responsibility to integrate our own shadow. Mm -hmm. But we'll never be able to change anybody else, right? This is about, you're talking about basically trying to change the world by first changing yourself. That's the only way to change the world. Mm -hmm. Because who influences you most? People who preach to you mm -hmm. are people who live a life and you see it in their life, their walking, their talk, their path. It's what I remember, um, I had a fortune to have a great uh, sage in India. I stayed two years mm -hmm. um, studying with him. And, and I, my son was very young then. And of course, we want our children to turn toward the spiritual and so mm -hmm. on. And he said, never impose, just live it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, best, that's the best advice of being a parent I ever heard. Yeah, it's true. So I never, you know, I never said he had to go to India with me. I never said he had to meditate or do this or that. And once we were living in New York City, and once he was about 12 years old, and he ran out to you know, go to school. He was running late. And two minutes later, I heard him come back. I thought he forgot his book or something. And I said, uh, what happened? He said, oh, I forgot to do my meditation. <laughs> How old is he? He was 12. <laughs> he did a japa that took five minutes. Uh -huh. But he said it like, I forgot to brush my teeth. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. yes. <laughs> You know. Well, well yeah. what is the, let's talk about meditation and how it applies to uh, creativity and how it applies to sort of being a more well-rounded person. What, what uh, is your take on meditation like, like a, in, in terms of the creative process? Uh, this may not be exactly the question you asked, mm -hmm. but I think I'd like to answer sure. it this way with your permission. It, as though you'd say, what about the spiritual life and mm -hmm. creativity? Mm -hmm. um, I personally, we all have our point of view about what is spiritual and so on. First of all, I don't believe everyone should follow the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think my path the only path or anything like It's very individual mm -hmm. according to what vasanas or tendencies you're born with mm -hmm. that can go way back, you know. But I personally believe that we're here for the soul's growth, the evolution of the soul. And the soul's a very ruthless entity, mm -hmm. you know, the psyche or the soul. The soul, your growth may come from divorce or disease or, or you know, all kinds of things that we'd see as very negative things. Mm -hmm. And yet those dark things somehow are the portal through which we have the greatest growth. Well, I would say that uh, um, imagine that your life was completely static, everything was perfect, there was never anything wrong. How boring would that be? Well, you not would, only boring, <laughs> there'd be no reason for you to be here. Right, right. It, you know, it, it's like the, the you know, you, you only are able to appreciate the, the triumphs by going through the challenges, right? And even the, true, but mm -hmm. even the triumphs like I've won a lot of awards with my writing and such. I, I don't think it's about, that to me is a side effect. It's right. not the main thing. But it's that I know one thing I'm, I've been very c confirmed about from the world and my inner self, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing this time around. I'm <laughs> writing and I'm teaching, mm -hmm. writing. Those are the two things and I get that confirmation in a lot of ways and I think there's a word Sanskrit word called Dharma mm -hmm. in India Dharma means the law of your existence I write about it in the new book it do, it's more than career or vo vocation there's a saying in India it's better to be a good farmer than a bad king 
It's better to be a good farmer than a bad king. Or you could say a good housewife. Right, than a right. In, in other words, uh, yeah, yeah. You, Do you, what you're supposed to be yeah. doing mm -hmm. and not think, oh, you know, it doesn't seem grand or what. Or a good parent than mm -hmm. a profession. It could mm -hmm. be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's so, no, there's no uh, thing that you have to go out there and aspire to do. It's be good at anything that you're no, doing. No, no, no. It's not to be good at anything. Okay. That's not what I'm saying all right. at all. Mm -hmm. Find your dharma. Uh -huh. Something inside you, usually what we are, starts when we're children. Right. You can track the seeds. You know, I was a little girl putting on plays and writing little scripts mm -hmm. when I was eight and nine years old, charging a quarter <laughs> to, for people to come and see them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it often shows early. Mm -hmm. So find what your, well, Joe Campbell, who was a friend of mine in New York, said, mm -hmm. follow your bliss. Joseph Campbell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. He was mm -hmm. a friend mm -hmm. during my acting days. I knew mm -hmm. him. You're talking wife. about uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, that's I hadn't read any of his yeah. book. We were thrown together socially. He loved mm -hmm. the theater. We used to go to plays and mm -hmm. discuss them. And of course, Campbell spoke like he wrote. He, yeah. his mind, he had a very um, expansive mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know. But to find what you can say what turns you on, but it's not an ego turns you on. Mm -hmm. And it's not about fame or money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about find, you'll know when you find it because there's an ease and mm -hmm. it's effortless. Right. You know, you're swimming with the current and mm -hmm. not against it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's Dharma. And the reason for that is that's how the soul grows. So anyway, that's my particular yeah. take on it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And you know, I, I love Joseph Campbell. There's a there's a great uh, story that I found on on YouTube that he was once telling uh, about uh, how it's not the the uh, the challenges that that uh, we celebrate or that drive us, but it's the like he he was, he was making a metaphor about uh, um, Jesus on his way to the cross. It was, it was what he was talking about. And he was talking about how how so many you know people put him on his cross, and it's like oh you know like the sacrifice and the suffering and all of these things. And these are the things that you concentrate on. But it was more about how he uh, had gone to the cross like a bride's a bridegroom to the bride, and mm -hmm. how he had gone with such a confidence because that's that, that was, was his uh, dharma. Yeah, that was his dharma yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And and that really um, stuck with me because yeah. it's that it's that. Uh, um, that knowing in an uncertain situation, it's it's having the faith in your own creativity, which again goes back to writing. You know, because a lot of people mm. tend to just say, oh, "I can't do this," or "I can't finish it," because I don't have the uh, yeah. the confidence that it's going to work out. Yeah. You know, one way yeah. or the other. Or the fear that it won't be good. Mm -hmm. But you see, it's not being good or bad or getting fame and all that. Mm -hmm. There's also a power in completion. Right. Whatever you're doing to go to the end of it and complete. When I was teaching at the New School uh, University in New York, I had a middle-aged man come in. He was writing a play. He said, about, he said, I've been working on a play about my family for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. I said, that's interesting. How much, how much is down on paper? Oh, I haven't put anything on paper yet. <laughs> it's all up here. <laughs> but he had been working on it. That was his point of view for mm -hmm. 20 years. Yeah, well, I say that a lot. <laughs> well, that year he had a first draft done, mm -hmm. you know. Well, how do you, yeah. okay, so let's, let's this so is really interesting to me personally because I, I suffer from this writer's sort of, uh, not, not writer's block, but just writer's procrastination, or I don't know what you would call it. And I know there's a chapter in your book on, there's on a whole sort chapter of the on time it. and space of writing, right? You well, know. there's also, in Way of Story, there's a whole chapter on writer's block. Mm -hmm. Procrastination is one part of writer's block. Mm -hmm. There's a reason you procrastinate, too. So how do I get over Un unconscious. <laughs> well, um, well, I could say read the chapter. It's not one <laughs> quick answer. Mm -hmm. But I also, I used to worry, I experienced that. I used to worry, how can I call myself a writer? Because Virginia Woolf wrote every single day. Yeah. I never mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. If I'm writing on a project, I'll write every day, very intensely, and I work quickly as a rule. But when I finish something, I might have one or two months where I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. Of course, a writer's always writing in his head. Right. But then I realized my output was the same or more as people who were writing every day. So I realized you have to find your own process. Mm -hmm. And also timing's important. You may have a project you want to do and you keep putting off. 
and it may not be the right time. And I mentioned that Irish story. I carried it around in my head mm -hmm. for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And then one day I sat down and I wrote the screenplay in 10 days. So it can be timing. But it's better not to wait too long for inspiration. There's something, another quote I give in my classes, it's my own quote, but it says, the hardest part is sitting down. Yeah. So it's creating that time and space. And usually, if you can, write in the same place every day. If so how, how do you create the time and space to write? Well, for me, mornings are my time. Someone mm. else may be an owl, they may not like late at night or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no one way to write any, just like there's no one way to live your life. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's morning. So when I walk into my, I have a separate room for writing. I go into that room. It's like walking into the bathroom or the kitchen. You know what those rooms are for. Mm -hmm. So you don't procrastinate, right? Mm -hmm. You know what you're there for. You go to your bedroom, you're going to go to sleep, whatever. Um, so when I walk into my office at space, it builds up an energy, and I know what I'm there for. Mm. And you know, you may just start writing a jumble or just write freeform writing. You're not sure where it's going. Hemingway had a good technique. Ernest Hemingway, he would purposely, after every day's work, leave a sent stop mid sentence. The last sentence he did that day, he would not write the whole sentence. So he could come back the next day and finish the sentence and already know, <laughs> so he would yeah. get him back to the, yeah. to the typewriter again. That's great. So the hardest part <laughs> is sitting down, and I have to let you in on it. It doesn't change after writing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's still yeah. starting as it is. It is, and, I, and that's that's exactly what I find hard. And I and I also find now that the uh, the internet has become a big distraction because it's really easy to say, well, I'll do some research and I'll just I'll look browse. this up, and then pretty yeah. soon you're looking at Yahoo or Facebook or something else, yeah, and yeah. you're not writing. You could spend your <laughs> life doing that. Yes. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't quite understand that draw, but mm -hmm. I know it's out there. Yeah. Of that. Mm -hmm. I went on Facebook because mm -hmm. friends kept urging me to. So I went on one day. Three days later, I heard from people I went to high school oh, with. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, these long notes. And, sure. I, and they were people I didn't even want to know then, <laughs> much less now. Uh, don't I tell mean, them that. <laughs> yeah, well, no names will be mentioned. So I thought, this is not for me. I'd yeah. rather read books. Or, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that books are becoming a... Um, a more and more of a rare art, you know, in that in that the the, the holding of a physical book, uh, you know, is giving way to Kindle and you know the iPad and you know all, well, all of these things. Well, let's hope there's room for both. Yeah, I, I think there will be. Since I teach all over the world now, I fly a lot. Mm -hmm. My son gave me a Kindle, and I'm very it's wonderful. So I don't have to lug around nine yes. books in my luggage. So I love it for trips. But at home. I love holding a real book, yes. but that may be a generational thing mm -hmm. too. So if you could give uh, like one golden nugget uh, to anybody in, in the audience at home who, who, who really wants to write and, and also wants to, to heal themselves through their writing, um, what would that nugget be? Well, let me say two nuggets because okay. they're two different areas. In terms of writing, I would say write the story that you have the most passion for. Mm -hmm. It can be positive or negative. Like David Mamet, everything he writes is about corruption. Mm -hmm. Everything he's written on stage or screen is about corruption in one way or the other. That's what fires him. So find that. And uh, as for the heal yourself with writing, have the courage to know yourself. Mm -hmm the light and the dark, mm -hmm. and go to the end of yourself. And that will take you to the beginning of the real spiritual journey. What does go to, your end, go to the end of yourself mean to you? Mm -hmm. Well, like you feel um, things in yourself that are pulling you ways you don't understand. I'll give an example. Uh, in both books, I use elements of memoir. I use examples from my own life to illustrate certain principles I'm trying to teach. Uh, I was an actress. I was a success, not a gr well known actress, but I earned my living well and I got a lot of work, mostly in regional theater and, and New York. And I was 
I did a play at the Oslo in Florida, and Theater in America chose it to do, uh, what do they call it, great performances. I was playing the lead in this play. So, but something happened. I felt I wasn't supposed to be doing this anymore. So after that job, I quit acting cold turkey. Hmm. And my whole life was the theater. Really? But I followed that inner voice. Mm -hmm. I knew I had learned by then to trust that inner voice. For three months, I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. I went to, I was a guest of a friend who was getting married just outside New York, and she had other house guests there for the wedding. And I met an astrologer whom I had never met before. And we had time on our hands. And he said, let me look at your chart. Give me your particulars. So I did. He said, this is interesting. I see acting in your chart. And I nodded. He says, but it stops, in fact, right now in the hmm. last two or three months. It's very accurate. He said, but even though you did all right as an actor, your main work is in writing. Hmm. And then it clicked. Because I had always journaled, I always loved writing, but it never occurred to me it could be a profession, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. And then I didn't look back. I just mm. started writing. So, so what advice would you give? Uh, trust your inner voice. Trust your inner voice. Not the ego's voice, mm -hmm. but the inner voice. Because outwardly, it didn't make sense when I was succeeding. I just had a lead in a national play on television. Mm -hmm. Why I would stop then? It doesn't make sense, right? How do you uh, discern between the ego's voice and the Inner voice. Oh, that, can, that can be tricky. Mm -hmm. Something in you will know because it's not, well, in the example I gave, it wasn't a smart decision right. from the outside because mm -hmm. when you have a big um, exposure like national television, that's a time that can really help your career move up. But I've just learned, I can give one more example of intuition sure. in a different context. Um, I was invited, an actor's friend who was living in Europe came to New York and invited me over for tea on Central Park South, overlooking Central Park. I went in and she, uh, tea was coming and I, she sat me in a chair by the window overlooking the park. As soon as I sat in that chair, I had a feeling of danger. Hmm. Everything in my body and um, intuition said, get out of there. Mm -hmm. I tried to push it away because I thought that would be impolite. I've mm -hmm. just arrived. But it was so powerful. After 10 minutes, I said, Patricia, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to have to go. I left very quickly. 20 minutes later, I walked into my apartment. The phone was ringing. It was this actress. She said, Catherine, you'll never believe what happened. I said, what? You know that chair you were sitting in by the window? Those whole buildings in New York have these air conditioning units yes. that are huge, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. It had fallen off the top of the building and crashed into that window landing on the chair. Oh, no. I would have been killed. Wow. I would have been killed. Wow. So I learned early. I trust that intuitive yes. voice far more than my logical mm -hmm. brain. Well, how can someone else uh, tap into that? You can cultivate it. Mm -hmm. it. You know, it's there. But the last uh, chapter in this new book is, what's it called? Time and space for inner growth. Right. Create time mm -hmm. and space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're a very, especially America, we're a very busy country. Yes. <laughs> and we're very busy people. And we're also very inundated with information and noise and yeah. just constantly. And even know. if we have time, we're watching television right. or, as you say, you're browsing on the net. But what about just organizing a half hour once a week to do absolutely nothing? Mm -hmm. It can be being in nature and just taking a walk and watching or listening to music and closing your eyes and letting images come, mm -hmm. see what comes up. That's, those are the moments when your deeper self can m speak to you and dreams mm -hmm. through your dreams. Well, I think you have meditation as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you know, the whole life can be a meditation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be just sitting in the corner with. Elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean by your, your whole life can be a meditation? In, in what sense? I think sp uh, what helped me learn with the practice I did in India, and I did do a lot of meditation, mm -hmm. I still do, and that can help see that 
it's not just about closing your eyes and sitting in a corner. Mm. It's how you perceive the world. Right. You see, mm -hmm. it's, it's not about what happens in the world or doesn't happen. It's your perception. And meditation can help you create a little distance from the perception, mm -hmm. so you become a little less attached to mm -hmm. the uh, what I think happens. Someone like Eckhart Tolle or Buddha, for that matter, would say uh, that it's about living right now. It's it's that it's that uh, uh, moment by moment yes. uh, being present every yes. moment. Yeah. You know, like uh, I, uh, to me, sometimes washing the dishes is meditation. You know, like uh, exactly. uh, cleaning my room is meditation. Well, you've answered you know? <laughs> your question. Right. That's exactly well, yeah. what I meant. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's if you place yourself there totally, usually we're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, really, it's not about being in the now. It's realizing that's all we have. Right. There right. is nothing mm -hmm. else but and that, the now. And that goes back to that whole idea that you can change your past or you can also plan your future, you know, because you only have this moment and it's, it's just a memory or a, or a wish, really. And we've yeah. already uh, looked into what we think is memory is our subjective memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting, like if you say you're in a car crash, there are definitely two points of view there about what happened. Mm -hmm. The person who hit you or, or you know, <laughs> they're not the same story. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like that, um, memory is not written in stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you have any, um, any other uh, last advice that you would give to, uh, to, to people who are, are looking to um, maybe get into writing or uh, journaling, and especially from this kind of a, um, a higher perspective of how, they would, how, can they, how can they bring through these authentic stories? Uh, well, I think the new book might address that because there are short, short mm -hmm. focused journaling, ac no writing experience is needed in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, you can start. And it's a way to look into the imprints from your childhood and to be aware of what patterns you're living with, negative or positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a chapter on ancestors. And, um, you know, it, it's an interesting personal journey to take just to, and you can do it on your own or with groups. It's mm -hmm. written like that. And, of course, I do workshops all over, too. But like next month, I'm teaching uh, every August, I'm at Esalen. Every August, you're at Esalen? Yeah, August 11th to 16th this mm -hmm. year. Okay, and then uh, you're going to be in Italy, I understand, isn't this? Uh, yes. I think I have a paper That's on it. That's next uh, year. Yes, yeah, so it's the last in, in week Tuscany. In May. If you can see the photo at home, it's kind of a beautiful state. So, so how does somebody go to Tuscany to, to uh, uh, be in your uh, workshop? Uh, the best way is to go to my website, mm -hmm. wayofstory.com, mm -hmm. wayofstory.com, and that has my schedule of where I am when. I'm teaching in India and Kuwait and different places. Mm -hmm. And also every six months in Ojai, California, I do a one-day workshop, Way of Story. Sometimes people like to come back, take it again. Mm -hmm. So I, I mix, by the way, beginning writers and professional writers oh, in the same group. And they seem to feed each other. Mm -hmm. So that seems to work. And also there's three online courses. Mm -hmm. uh, they're with dailyom.com. But uh, if you just go to wayofstory.com, the three, one's way of story, one's heal yourself with writing, and there's one called Beyond Survival. Mm -hmm. Uh, guide to a creative life. Hmm. So, and I have a blog, and I do consultant work. Everything's on the website. Mm -hmm. um, so, Catherine, this has been a wonderful conversation. I mean, we could go on and on it. like all day. You yeah, know, I'm sure. I know. You know, um, about many different subjects. These are the real you. subjects. Yes, yes. Um, and and uh, I think that uh, there's nothing more important that we can talk about than being more authentic through our own stories and, and about our own stories and about the stories that we tell and and uh, and um, finding the stories that heal right right because mm -hmm. because that uh, uh, I think yeah. that uh, cinema anyway at least to me is is still an evolving um, art form it's changing we don't know where it's going to line up you know things are going more online in different places information is traveling ever faster all over the world but but to tell a great story um, can still it can change lives literally all over the world for better or for or better good. or for worse you know and and so yeah. to to any potential storyteller sitting at home mm -hmm. you know like you know use this as a as a rallying call to 
make your own stories, like, you know, to tell the stories that are, you're passionate about, you know, that, that really can go out and, and change the world because you have the power to do that. And that's something that 100 years ago would have been a lot harder to do. And, and today we can do yes. that through the stories that we tell. Amen to that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, Catherine, um, thank yeah. you. I want to go out thank with you. you reading from the prologue, which oh, yes. is really beautiful, from, yes. from Way of Story. What I'd like to ask you to do is not only hear the words, but try, close your eyes and try and feel the words. So this is prologue to the way of story. In the beginning was story. The caveman rushed back to his tribe and excitedly acted out his encounter with some Paleolithic beast. This was his story and forever after he would be remembered by this story. Stories have a sacred dimension not because of gods, but because a man or woman's sense of self and her world is created through them. These stories orient the life of a people through time, establishing the reality of their world. Thus meaning and purpose are given to people's lives. Without story, we do not exist. The way of story is how we discover who we are. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it's beautiful yes. having you here. And yes. we are another version pleasure. of you. This has been The Waking Universe, and yeah. we're signing off for now. Thank you. Yeah.